Turn in your hymnals, please, to hymn number 529. No, not one. And again, you can remain seated today. No, not one, 529. We'll sing all five stands. you do. If you don't, I don't think you should question Jesus. I think you should question where you're at in your standing with him uh, because he is there for us. He, he does understand what we're going through uh, and, and, and so much more than that. I know this song puts him on a personal level. He's even more than that. He's, he's a high, he's our king, he's our, our sovereign, uh, but he does care for us. So I hope that you experience that with him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Father, thank you that you sent your son to come and provide for our salvation. But even more than that, Father, you've provided so that we can have a personal relationship with you. We can have a personal relationship with him. And uh, we're grateful for that. I pray that you'd help each one of us to experience that. Especially, Father, as the song is, is pointing out, when we're going through tough times and we're going through difficult times, help us to sense his presence uh, through the Holy Spirit as uh, you provide for us, as you take care of us. And uh, may we truly have joy as we uh, fellowship with you, even during the dark times. Thank you, Lord. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let's go through a couple announcements. We've got a number of things here. First of all, today is our first picnic of the summer. I hope that you came prepared to uh, go to Hartwick Pines with us. If you can't, that's okay. Uh, we'll eat grilled food and desserts and stuff without you. That's, uh, that's all right. We, we will still enjoy it. But we'd love to have you there. It would be a good time of fellowship. There is the festival going on 
at the, the camp, found out that they are having it today as well. Looks like the weather is going to be good. So we'll invite you to come with us and we'll uh, take a walk out uh, to the festival while we're doing it. So uh, right after church, we'll all head over to Hartwick Pines. In fact, if one of you can leave right away, we're hoping to get the pavilion there in the picnic area. We usually are able to get it. If someone else is there, the weather's going to be good anyway. We'll just find another spot big enough for all of us to enjoy each other's company. We're going to bring our grill with us and uh, we'll just start uh, cooking meat right away as we get going on that. So we would invite you to be there with us after that. Uh, members, remember that next Sunday afternoon we're having our quarterly business meeting. That's coming up. And then we are still planning on our, um, our baptism service at the end of the summer. Uh, that would be the last Sunday, August 28th. It will be at Maslinski's, and we'll turn that into a big picnic as well. So we invite you to come with that. And if you're interested in baptism, see me, and uh, we'll talk about it. Oh, I've already got several people that have, and uh, we're going we're gonna to have a good time as we do that. Now, I've got a few other things. Uh, something new coming up. Lynn is planning a uh, ladies' shopping day. Uh, several ladies have talked to her about the idea that let's go away on a day and do some shopping and just kind of have fun. So she's put up a uh, sign-up sheet out there on the information table. It's going to be Tuesday, July 26th, which is a week from this Tuesday, the next week Tuesday. And, uh, and it's going to be from 10 till about 4, give or take a little bit. They're going to go down to Cadillac and hit some shops down there and do lunch together uh, and enjoy the time out. So if you're interested, uh, see Lynn, but also sign up on the info table so that uh, they can uh, plan on uh, the transportation, all of that. All right, we have a couple other things. Uh, first of all, uh, Tony Johns, her husband Dave, is having a heart cath this week, correct? On Thursday. So remember to pray for him as he goes, uh, goes through that and that uh, all will go well. And we'll, we'll pray uh, about that. And then Tony normally cleans our church for us. I don't know if you, didn't, if you knew that or not, but she normally does the cleaning, usually on Thursday, I think. And uh, she's not going to be able to do that this week. You don't think Dave would mind if you just came and cleaned while he's doing anything? <laughs> but no. Uh, so if you'd be willing to fill in for her just for the day, it, 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 uh, it isn't a, a huge job. You're not here for eight hours usually, right? No. Yeah, so, but, but if you would like to do that, uh, see me afterwards, and uh, we'll set you up uh, to be able to take care of those things. All right, I'll remind you that we have our offering plates uh, near the table, or near the doors as you're uh, coming or going. Feel free to put anything the Lord's laid on your heart to give, and uh, we'll take care of that for you. All right, with that said, let's go on and do some singing. Let's keep singing as we worship the Lord. We're going to sing one of our songs that's a newer song to us. We've sang it a couple times, uh, but not in a little while. We're going to sing... Every promise. So let's sing this song together. From the breaking of the dawn to the setting of the sun, I will stand on every promise.
Turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 32. As we've been singing these songs, um, I hope you uh, realize that, that um, they teach us a lot of truth. They teach us a lot of, of doctrine. That's why it's important that our songs reflect biblical teaching. And uh, we really want to be careful about that. And it's going to become apparent as we're in the book of Deuteronomy today that uh, that's part of God's purpose as well. God gave Moses a song to teach to the Israelites, to challenge them, to continue to walk with him. And I just want to read a part of that. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 32. I want to read just the first nine verses of that. It's actually a long song, so we're not going to do the whole thing. But let's read the first nine verses of Deuteronomy 32. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain, let my speech distill as the dew, as raindrops on the tender herb, and as showers on the grass. For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice a God of truth and without injustice. Righteousness and upright is he. They have corrupted themselves. They are not his children because of their blemish, a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, and he will show you, your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples, according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. And then that song goes on, and uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit as we get into the morning service today. But uh, God gave Moses that song as a way of teaching them these truths and challenging them to continue walking with them. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue on. Father, we thank you that uh, you are a God who has revealed himself to us. As we understand your scriptures, Lord, they teach that we could never have come up with the truth about you on our own. We could have never have come up with uh, all the, the things that reflect your person, your uh, intentions, your glory, but you have revealed them to us. You've revealed them through your scriptures. You've revealed them through your people Israel. You've revealed them through the Lord Jesus. You've revealed them through prophecy. And even now we wait as we know of prophecies of end time things uh, coming up. And uh, we're grateful, Lord, that you've shown us these things. Uh, we admit that we don't understand all of them. And uh, we need your help uh, to understand them and to apply them and to live for them. And I pray that you would uh, use them in our lives, even today, as we look into your word. Now, Father, as we uh, go on today, I pray that you would uh, help each one of us to uh, worship you uh, in our hearts as we give you the praise that you are worthy of. Uh, help us, Father, to uh, walk with you as we ought to because you deserve our allegiance. Uh, Father, we pray for those who weren't able to be here today. I, I know a number of them are traveling are uh, having other things that are going on, and we pray that you would keep them safe, uh, work in their lives, uh, draw them closer to you, uh, even today. And uh, now, Father, bless our gathering. Uh, may we bring honor to you. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing one more song together about the scriptures, actually. Ancient words. Words of life, words of hope. 
Turn again in your scriptures to the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to be looking at Deuteronomy 31 and 32 today. As you see, uh, I've entitled it, No Excuses, as the Lord is going to be dealing uh, with Israel here as they're getting ready to cross over into the promised land. Uh, the Lord has Moses delivering them this idea that, look, there's no excuses. Uh, you are going to be responsible for some of this. As we go, I wanted to read this to you. This is um, a- an interesting illustration about excuses. It says, the commanding officer was furious when nine GIs who had been out on passes failed to show up for morning roll call. Not until 7 p.m. did the first man straggle in. I'm sorry, sir, the soldier explained, but I had a date and lost track of time, and I missed the bus back. Being determined to get in on time, I hired a cab. Halfway there, the cab broke down. I went to a farmhouse and persuaded the farmer to sell me a horse. I was riding to camp when the animal fell over dead. I walked the last 10 miles and just got here. That sound good to you? (laughs) Though skeptical, the colonel let the young man off with a reprimand. However, after him, seven other stragglers in a row came in with the same story. Had a date, missed the bus, hired a cab, bought a horse, etc., etc. By the time the ninth man reported in, the colonel had grown weary of it. Okay, he said, now what happened to you? Sir, I had this date and missed the bus back, so I hired a cab. Wait, the colonel screeched at him. Don't tell me the cab broke down. No, sir, replied the soldier. The cab didn't break down. It was just that there were so many dead horses on the road, we had trouble getting through. (laughs) I think I'd give all nine of those guys KP duty. They're putting their stories together, aren't they? Interesting. No, we can make excuses for a lot of things, can't we? Our, our society is, is built around excuses, isn't it? Uh, so much of what's going on right now is because uh, everyone thinks it's not my fault, it's everyone else's fault. And uh, they just kind of push that way. Well, uh, Moses is going to challenge the Israelites today. He's not going to actually use the word excuse. I, I had to study these chapters. I read them over several times, and I'm going back, and, I, and this is my take on it, that I think he's trying to prepare them that, look, there, there's things I suppose you could claim as excuse, but you really have no excuse. And we're going to look at them. You see that I've got three of them there. Uh, the first excuse is there's a leadership change coming, and uh, that can create problems. Uh, then they could say, well, I can't remember all this stuff that you've left for us. And then the last excuse is, well, there's just no hope. Forget it. And uh, he's going to look at these things. But before we get into that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for uh, bringing us here today, and thank you for giving us your word. Help us, Lord, to be able to understand it and uh, be able to uh, live the way that you intend to us to live so that we could accomplish the purposes you've set out for us. Thank you, Father. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at this first excuse, uh, this leadership change. Uh, As you do that, think about this. Have you thought about how families can change when there's a leadership change. Have you ever noticed how some families change dramatically after an influential parent passes away? Have you, have you seen that? I, I'd venture to say most of us have seen families that have gone through that sort of thing. And I want to keep it just within the realm of faith. You know, when you have a a parent, either a father that loves the Lord or a mother that loves the Lord and how they can impact the family, and and then when they pass away, the family quite often can change. Maybe dad was a good leader. Uh, Maybe dad was an encourager, almost a chaplain type guy, that sort of a thing. Uh, And then now he's gone. Maybe mom was an influencer. Maybe mom had a way of just kind of uh, corralling everybody and getting everybody walking in step the way they should go. Maybe mom was just really loving and and it caused everyone to follow in in the way that she was hoping them to do. Uh, Think about that. I'm I'm thinking of one family in particular I know of that when the father passed away, there was great changes that took place in the family. Uh, The the father loved the Lord. Uh, The father encouraged his kids uh, to follow the Lord and so forth. But yet when he, when he passed, uh, the family changed quite a bit. Uh, some of the children fell away from the Lord. They, they quit walking with the Lord. And really, uh, you, you look at them and you almost think, how in the world 
Did they get to that place? Uh, some of the children did follow the Lord, and that was a good thing. But you just wonder, what's, what's going on? Why did this happen to, to go that way? What, what happened? Well, I believe because that person, the true person, was revealed. The, the person that was left after mom or dad passed away. Uh, they were revealed. Either they had a heart for the Lord, or they were just pretending. And I think sometimes you can see who the pretenders were. Who the, who the ones that were genuine were. You can certainly see that. Um, you can see that maybe they were just responding to mom and dad, which is a good thing. I mean, it was good that they respected mom and dad that much. It was good that they loved mom or dad that much, and, and they wanted to be pleasing to mom or dad. But once mom and dad were gone, the basis for what you would call faith was gone as well. And so now uh, they're not walking with the Lord. So their respect wasn't for the Lord, their love wasn't for the Lord. It was for whatever reason uh, with these other people. And now that they're gone, they're kind of lost, if you will. Ha have you seen that? Have any of you seen that sort of a thing happen? I know I've seen it a couple different times, actually, in a couple different families. And, and it can be sad to watch. Well, Moses is going to challenge Israel with this idea because Israel is about to have a leadership change. And he wants them to be prepared for it. And in this case, the leadership change is that Moses is not going to be there anymore. Moses is about to die. And uh, Joshua is going to take over for him. And what's that going to do to them? And he's going to challenge them for that. I want to read in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31, beginning at verse 1. Then Moses went and spoke these words to Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I can no longer go out and come in. Also, the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself crosses over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you, and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord has said. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites and their land, when he destroyed them. The Lord will give them over to you, and that you may do to them according to every commandment which I have commanded you. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. So he's challenging them. There's about to be this leadership change. I'm not going to be there with you. But you know that Joshua is going to be the leader. This has all been laid out. They've known this for a little bit of time. And he's saying, you're going to need to follow Joshua. And so he challenges them. He says, you need to be strong and of good courage. And, and you know what he's really saying when he says those words? He said, you need to be people of faith. You need to follow in the plans that God has laid out before you. We're telling you this ahead of time. You need to walk with the Lord. That's what being strong and of good courage means in this context. You need to follow him. And you need to follow his ways. That's why he said in the one spot, uh, do according to all these words that I've been giving to you. Uh, this law that I've laid out before you. You need to be strong and of good courage. And then he tells Joshua as well in verse 7. Joshua, you need to be strong and of good courage. You need to be a person of faith as you lead. And by the way, Joshua is going to be a good leader. Sometimes there, there are problems when there's a leadership change in that the next leadership that comes along may not be so good. Maybe they're a scoundrel or maybe for whatever reason they're just not a leader. But Joshua wasn't that way. Joshua is going to be a good leader. Remember, it's Joshua who's going to say later in the book of Joshua, he's going to say, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so Joshua was going to be good. It's not that they had bad leadership coming, but uh, they're being challenged. Be strong and of good courage. Well, we know the history of, of Israel. Uh, we, we know a lot of things that happened about them, and we kind of know some things that happened to them later on. But God knew it in advance, and he's going to warn them of it. And so he gives them a future prophecy. We can't read all of chapter 31 and chapter 32. I would I challenge you to go and read it sometime, but I'm going to hit some highlights here. Go down to verse 16, though, of chapter 31. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, meaning he's going to die, 
And this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of this land where, uh, where they go to be among them. And they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. That, that's pretty deep prophecy that God's going to... He's saying, these people are going to turn away from me. And if you continue reading in chapter 31 and chapter 32, he's going to tell them even more about this. These people are going to fall away. Moses is going to actually tell them at one point, look, I know that I'm about to die, and when I die, you people are going to go astray. And uh, he said, you went astray while I was here. That was bad enough, but when I'm gone, it's going to get even worse. So they're prophesying that these things are going to happen. The Lord already knows that. But I want to I wanna point this out to you. On the one hand, God knows that, and God knows everything, and, and he has a plan for how these things are going to work out. But on the other hand, God sometimes uses those things to challenge his people, to challenge his people to walk right. And to be with him. And I'm thinking that this is a part of what's playing. Uh, what, what we're going to see here, that God is going to give them a couple different things to help them remember all that he said to them. And one of them is a song that uh, he's going to have uh, Moses teach the children of Israel. So I want you to turn to chapter 32, the next chapter, and go to the end of the chapter. And look at this, which I, I was going to show that God means this to be a challenge for them. Yes, he's telling them right off the hand, look, you're going you're gonna to turn away. But yet he still challenges them. Look at verse 44 of the end of, of chapter 32. So Moses came with Joshua the son of Nun and spoke all the words of this song in the hearing of the people. Moses finished speaking all these words to all Israel. And he said to them, Set your hearts on all the words which I testify among you today, which you shall command your children to be careful to observe all the words of this law. For it is not a futile thing for you. Because it is your life. And by this word, you shall prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. So imagine this. It's, this is one of those things that's kind of hard to, to grasp with our human mind sometimes because our minds are finite. But God is saying, on the one hand, he's given prophecy to Moses saying these, these people are going to turn. They're, they're going to walk away. But on the other hand, he's challenging them. Look, you need to learn this song. You need to teach this to your children. And then you need to follow my word. So he's giving them a chance, if you will. And, and the reason I point that out is some people, when they think about faith, they, they think of it in a fatalistic sort of a sense. And they say, look, God's already got it all figured out. Why even try God's got it all figured out, so why even bother? But here's an instance here where God does have it figured out, but yet he's still offering to them, here's your chance. You need to do this. See, one of the things that we get wrong in faith sometimes is we, we think that in some res respects we're robots. And in some respects we, um, we can't really help ourselves. We're going to do what God has planned. You know, for instance, I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe God has it planned out. I believe God has all these things figured out. But yet the scriptures also teach that we're still responsible for our choices. We're responsible for our actions. And that's what God is doing here is he's laying it out before them, even though he said these. And by the way, the song, you go and read the song. One of the things the song does, it spends a long time telling them that you're going to turn away from me. You're not going to walk with me. And because you turn away, here are some of the judgments that are going to befall you. And yet, after all that, he says in verses 44 to 47, uh, you need to learn this so that you can challenge yourselves. And you can teach your children so that your children will be challenged to walk with me and to obey my word. So he's saying, if you will, prove me wrong if you can. Now, I, again, I think this is important because God has given them a choice. God is saying, on the one hand, you are not robots. You have a choice. Don't ever take the idea that, hey, what happens, happens. God's got it all figured out, and we're just going to be that way. That, that's kind of a, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? That's where people believe in, in, in fatalism. That's what I was thinking of. That, that's a fatalist type of idea. Oh, you know, what's going to be is going to be. No, God says, you have a choice here. And you're going to be held responsible for your choices. That's what he's telling the children of Israel. You are not robots. And so therefore, the accountability that God is laying on them, they're, they're, they're going to have to answer to. They're being accountable for those things. So you need to walk with the Lord. So be careful about that. 
Don't, don't let these, don't let these, uh, these things uh, pile upon you and you just say, ah, oh, forget it, and walk away. No, you're still responsible. And so God wants them to learn, wants them to think, wants them to make good decisions. By the way, yes, Israel is going to fall away from the Lord. And, and Israel as a nation is going to turn away from him on numerous occasions. But there's always a remnant. There's always a remnant of people that are walking with God within his, his nation of Israel. Remember when I, it was uh, Elijah or Elisha, I think, that, that was so bothered with the idea that I'm the only one, I'm the only one. And God says, nope, I've reserved 7,000 that haven't bowed to me today. So there's always a remnant, and I believe that's where this challenge comes. Uh, never will the whole nation turn and walk away. Enough of them will to where God's going to punish the whole nation, but there's always going to be those that are going to continue to walk with them. So even with this leadership change coming, even with Moses going, and he was the main personality that God was using to draw them in, they're still going to be responsible for their choices. They need to follow the Lord. They need to follow Joshua as their next leader. So this, this uh, leadership change is not an excuse. God isn't going to accept it. Well, let's go and look at the next one. The next excuse that, they're, that they could possibly have is, well, I can't remember all these things. Well, how, how do you remember things? How, how do you find ways to remember things? There's lots of uh, memory devices we can have. Have you ever tied a string on your finger? Come on, admit it. Have any of you ever actually tied a string on your finger to remind yourself of something? Well, some of you might have. And, and I know that seems weird because what does a string mean? But if you tie a string on your finger and you look at that, it's going to be hard to uh, to forget why you tied that string on there. So that's the idea behind it, right? All right, tying a string on your finger is an idea. What about word association? Uh, you, can have, uh, you can have a word association. I, I remember there's, a, there's a, a guy that I see from time to time uh, where I work at Dubois. He comes in. Well, I have his daughter in school. She's like a second grader. I mean, a young little kid. And, uh, and the way I remember her name is I remember an old TV show. And so I remember one of, the, one of the characters in the show had her name. But the problem is, I was talking to his dad the other day, and I kept using the wrong name. Well, it turned out I wasn't using the character's name. I was using the name of the actor who played the character. So my word association just failed. It, uh, it didn't, didn't help me at all. And, and maybe you've done that. What, what are the, some words that you might associate with certain things to help you remember certain things? All right, that's word association. Did you know that we as Christians, we use songs. We use songs to teach us a lot of truth. And, and songs help us with a lot of things. Uh, there, there's a couple songs that I could say that all of you as believers would right away go, okay, I, I know. I might not know all the words to it, but I know, I know some of the words to it, and, and there's great truth. What about the song, Amazing Grace? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, well, the first thing is teaching is that I'm a wretch. Now, now, people who are into self-esteem and all that, they're not going to like all that. But the Bible, I'm sorry, the Bible recognizes that we're sinners. And before a holy God, face it, we are wretches. Uh, there are worse wretches, and there are some that are not quite as bad wretches. But in front of a holy God, we're wretches. So it's grace that saved a wretch like me. Think of some of the other truths that might come up from that song. Well, there's other songs that we sing. Uh, you could just go through your hymnal and you could just look through the, the index in the back and look, and right away you'll, you'll start, oh, you might start humming some of those songs. But we, we teach a lot of truth that way. What about the song, Jesus Loves Me? Jesus Loves Me. Oh, no, no, I got the wrong tune. Jesus Loves Me. This I know for the Bible tells me. So, okay, you, you, know, you know what I learned that song from? A, 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 a believer I can't remember which believer it was, but they said, uh, during COVID, you need to make sure you wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. And they said, sing to yourself, Jesus loves me. I started doing that. I would go and wash my hands. i go, Jesus loves me. This I know. And I'd wash my hands for a good 20 seconds or longer uh, doing the song. But you know what? There's truths that are coming out as I do that. Do I know that the Lord loves me? Yes, I do. And, and lots of other things. Why, why do we teach those songs to kids uh, just for just for some of those purposes. Remember back when you went to VBS as a kid? Probably most of you have been to VBS or something like that. I mean, you remember some of the VBS songs that you learned? Some of the funny songs? Some of the songs that maybe had motions to it or whatever? Well, we do that. Why? Because we're teaching truth that comes with it. Sure, we do that. Well, there's other things we do uh, to teach scriptural truth. Uh, are you familiar with a wordless book? 
How many of you are familiar with the wordless book? The wordless book is a way of sharing the gospel. And I've actually got a Bible. Someone, I'm, I'm not sure who here gave me this Bible, but I've got it in my office here. And it's, it's actually got the wordless book. And what the wordless book is, is colored pages. You'll start like one page is uh, black, and that stands for sin. We're sinners before God, and, and so that we're, we're black. And then another page is red. That stands for the blood of Jesus. Another page is green. That stands for eternal life, and I'm, I'm getting them all mixed up right now. And then there's a page for white that means that we've been washed as white as snow and so forth. But we use that wordless book because it's a great way to be able to help people to know how to share the gospel. You look at those colors. You remember what the colors stand for. And you can share the gospel. So the, the wordless book is a good thing. Uh, some of you would have gone to Awana or maybe helped, helped uh, lead in Awana in your churches. Well, one of the things Awana did is it taught kids to learn scripture. Well, why do we do that? So they, they learn uh, truth. So we would get them to memorize it. And, and in order to get them to memorize it, we would offer them points. And we would offer them prizes and other things like that so that they'd have to memorize those things. I, I think that that's... That's a good thing. I think a lot of kids would forget a lot of that stuff, but at least it was a good effort to teach them truth and so forth, so they're memorizing scripture. Do you realize that when the Lord Jesus left us a couple different ordinances, we call them, to practice in our churches, he did them as memory devices, as memory learning. Well, one of them is we've got our communion table right here. It says, do this in remembrance of me. When we practice communion, uh, we're, we're, we're taking the bread symbolizing his body uh, that was given for us. We're taking the, the juice that symbolizes his blood that was shed for us. Those are all memory devices. We've been talking about baptism. Baptism's coming up. Well, that's what baptism is. Baptism is a picture, a physical picture of a spiritual reality. That uh, I died with Christ when he died on the cross for my sins. I was buried with Christ as he was buried with my sins. And I rise again to new life as Jesus rose to new life. That's the picture that baptism is painting. It's a memory device. And so those are all very helpful. Well, the Lord is going to leave Israel a couple memory devices so that they can remember uh, what God expects of them and so forth. Let's look at these. I'm back in chapter 31 of uh, Deuteronomy. And I want to go to verse 9 of chapter 31. So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place which I choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law, and that your children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you cross the Jordan to possess. So you see, God has given them a, a memory thing here. He's given them the scriptures. He told Moses to write this down, and they're giving it to the priest. They're going to put it in the, in the Ark of the Covenant, if you will, and then they're telling them, every seven years, pull it out and read it to the whole group. The group's going to come together for several festivals during the year. One of those festivals is, is the Feast of Tabernacles. When they come together on the seventh year for the Feast of Tabernacles, that's when I want you to read this because everyone needs to hear it. And, and just think about this for a moment. Uh, everyone, even the kids, are going to hear it this year. Seven years later, those kids are going to be, what, teenagers probably. But there's a new batch of kids coming along behind them. They need to hear it. And then they need to hear it again when they're teenagers. And then the adults need to hear it when they're in their 20s, when they're in their 30s, and, and as they go on. He, he wants them to hear it again all the time. Why? Because it needs to be before them. They need to hear those things. And they need to realize that they are responsible for them. By the way, one of the things that you'll notice when you are, are going through the history of Israel, you get into some of the kings of Israel, and, and you'll find that it says the king, they did a search, and they found a book in, in the archives, and they dusted it off, and they decided to read it. That was the scriptures. Well, you know what that means? They weren't doing this every seven years. They weren't following what they were supposed to do. Had they have done that, what kind of help might it have given them? 
What kind of, of obedience could it have led to of the people of Israel? Instead, the people got away from doing the things that the Lord wanted them to do because they weren't hearing what it was that the Lord wanted them to do. Very, very important. So the scriptures were vital for them. Keep informing the next generation. Well, that wasn't the only thing he did. He went on from there. Go down to verse 19 of Deuteronomy 31. Now, therefore, write down this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. And this song is actually most of chapter 32, that we're not going to take the time to go through the whole song, but that song is going to be a memory device for them. It's going to be a doctrinal reminder. If they will sing this song, and I don't know what the tune is, I think the tune would be important, they, they would have a tune that would go with it, but as they sing that, they're going to be reminded of a number of things. They're going to be challenged by the Lord, because the Lord is going to predict that they're going to walk away from him. Well, guess what? Some of these people, as they learn the song, are going to say, that's right, that's going on right now. Right now, that's what's happening to us. And they're going to get that. And they're going to be reminded of those things, and it's going to be a witness against them. Several times throughout Israel's history, they would have a godly king that would rise up and say, we need to follow the Lord because they got this. And they remembered, we need to walk with him. And God would bless them again. So that's kind of the purpose of this. By, but by teaching them this song, it'd be something that everyone could remember. Keep in mind, they didn't have individual Bibles back then. They didn't have individual copies of the scriptures like we have. I mean, we have, we have copies of the scriptures all over the place. How many do you have at home? I mean, I think through all that I've got at home, I've got tons of them. Uh, one of the things is Lynn and I have a, a, uh, um, a centerpiece in one of our rooms that is a collection of family Bibles that we were able to go through, and we got from several family members, we got our parents' Bibles, we were able to get our grandparents' Bibles, we were able to get even some great-grandparents, we were able to go ways down, and as other family members started uh, realizing that we were doing this, we started having people giving us copies of these Bibles. If you ever come to our house, that we'll show you, we'll show it to you. There's a, there's a lot of interesting uh, parts of that. But, but we have lots of copies of the Bibles. And then you go to our other bookshelves, especially since I'm a pastor and I have to study and do lots of things like that. I've got lots of different copies of that. And, and probably most of you do. Do you remember then the days when you used to have one of those big family Bibles on your coffee table in your house? One of those big things. I remember hearing a, hearing a joke one time, a Christian comedian talking about getting a 97-pound Schofield reference Bible and pounding someone over the head with it. And boy, those big ones there, that's kind of how they, what they were like. But we've all had the scriptures. Well, well, we have all of those things. And these songs is what God wanted Israel to have. Not only the scriptures that they had there, but he wanted to have songs because they didn't have copies of those things. That's how they could remember so much of this truth. And he wanted them to remember. Now, if we were to take the time to look into chapter 2 and go through the song uh, bit by bit, you'll see that there's a section that's praising God. We actually read that already this morning. And then there's a section where he tells them, remember, we read the first couple verses of that. Remember what God has done. Remember how God led you out of, Israel, out of Egypt. Remember how God led you through the wilderness and what he did for you. He's telling them to remember those things. And then he's going to talk about judgment. Because you're not remembering and because you're not following, here's the types of judgments that are going to come upon you. But then he ends the song by telling them, but guess what? God's going to make atonement for you. God's going to, going to rescue you, if you will. And this is all in this song that he's challenging them with. He wants them to have that. So God wants them to be able to remember. So he's given them the scripture so that if they'll do this and read it every seven years, everyone's going to hear that. Every seven years. Now, that might not seem like a lot, but at least it's every seven years. I mean, you've got the opportunity to read it. You've got the opportunity to read through the Bible in a year. Do, do, how many of us read through the Bible in a year? I've done it a few times. I know some of you have done it a few times. But I, I would be willing to think that not many of us do it every year. So seven years isn't so bad for them to hear this law read to them as they go. But it, it's that memory device. And then this song will help them remember it even more. God is giving him those things. Basically, God's saying this. Look, ignorance is no excuse. Ignorance is no excuse. I've, I've given you ways to remember what I'm saying to you. You've got the actual scriptures that should be read regularly, every seven years at least. 
And uh, you've got this song that if you'll teach it, uh, not just to yourselves, but teach it to your children, they'll recall what it is that God expects for them. You remember a number of years ago we were doing the after-school program? Uh, there, were, there were a number of us that went and we did the after-school program in the elementary school. Every day after school, uh, we had a gymnasium there that we could use, and we'd have 25, 30, 35 kids that would be in there. And the vast, uh, there were several kids that were from other churches that would come, and, and it was just extra learning for them. But there were a lot of kids there that didn't go to church anywhere. And it was basically their mom and dad looked at it as a, a free babysitting after school. And that's okay. We used it for that purpose so that we could teach them. And they were being taught the gospel. They were being taught the scriptures. Uh, one year, Paul, Paul was our main teacher. And one year we went through the whole Bible and he made a timeline that went down the whole wall of the gymnasium. And he started with, uh, with uh, God creating and then um, Adam and Eve. And it went, there was a place for Abraham. And then there was a place for the kings and we're of Israel. Then we got up to where Jesus was born. And, and it just went on. But we did this whole thing for the whole year. Why? We wanted those kids to learn that. And we wanted them to have a visual that they would remember. And, and all this was to give them an opportunity to, to put some of that in here. So it could be recalled. Well... We, we did it for about eight years. We, we, we stopped doing it uh, eventually. But as I'm teaching the high school, I run into those kids all the time. And I must admit, I wonder, boy, I wonder how much of that they're recalling. And, and I, can't, I can't control it anymore, but the Holy Spirit can. The Holy Spirit can bring those things back to mind. So that it was put there in their mind so that they could uh, pull it out again. And I'm hoping that one day the, the Lord will use that for many of them to bring them to him, help them remember the gospel. I mean, we went over the gospel so many times. I would say maybe every single week the gospel was mentioned to some extent that Jesus died for our sins and that they could have eternal life by, by having their sins personally forgiven. And, and we did that so that they would know that the stuff's put there. Well, that's what God is giving to them, giving to Israel, that they have the opportunity to keep hearing his truth either through the scriptures or through this song or through the other song that they sing. Well, the same thing's true for us, right? We don't have an excuse. Ignorance is no excuse. If we're ignorant of the scriptures, it's because we are purposely not finding ways to keep the scriptures coming. By the way, that's what going to church is about, and I'm glad you're here. I know I'm preaching to the choir right now. But that, that's one of the reasons we come to the church, that we keep hearing God's truth. We keep hearing the truth. Uh, and, and we've got the opportunity for that. We've got plenty of copies of the scriptures in our homes. Uh, we need to take advantage of that. We've got opportunities to learn those things. But when you come to church, uh, we, we want to teach you the scriptures and we want to sing songs that teach the scriptures, that teach scriptural truth. That's why we do those things. You might wonder, well, how come we don't do this song or that song? Well, maybe it's just because we don't know it. But, but frankly, there are some songs that aren't worthy of our time. They don't teach enough. I remember when I was in uh, Bible college, I sang in a, in a quartet that we would go around and sing in different churches on weekends and stuff. And uh, we would work on songs with one of our music professors there. And I remember there was one song that I really liked. It's kind of a contemporary song, but it was called Little Flowers. Little Flowers Never Worry. I thought it was kind of a neat song. But, but when I brought it to, the, to my professor and I said, look, could we learn this song? And, and I can't remember his exact words, but basically what he was saying to me is, is that's pretty shallow. We can, we can learn songs that teach more than that. And, and you know what? He was right. He was right. It was pretty shallow. We were going into churches with people of all levels. We need to, we need to deliver a little bit more than that. So, so I would say the same thing's true here. There's some songs that we may not sing uh, that you might hear on the radio or something like that. And uh, again, maybe it's just that we don't know it, but, but a lot of times it's because it's not saying very much. Let's, the song, we only sing every, every Sunday here. I think we sing, what is it, five songs? One, two, three, four. We sing five songs every week, sometimes only four. And uh, uh, I, I want to make sure that there's songs that are teaching us truth, and we're going to spend time uh, with those more than a lot of others. And, and again, that doesn't always mean that we don't like the others, but, but we want to make sure we're getting good stuff as we're doing that, that we can remind ourselves. I would like to think that as you walk out of church, you'll hum one of the songs we sang today. And as you hum that song, you'll remember some of the truths that were taught there. And so that's the idea. That's also another reason why we don't want to sing songs that aren't exactly scripturally correct. 
because uh, we, if you're going to be remembering those words, I, I want you to remember words that are good and words that are true, scripturally speaking. Okay? All right, let's, uh, let's go on. Uh, ignorance is no excuse, and God wasn't going to let them do that. Uh, the last excuse we have here is that some people can say, look, there's just no hope. As they hear all these things that, uh, that God is doing, as they hear that, uh, that uh, you're already telling us we're going to fall away anyway, there's no hope. But God didn't leave them that way. It might look like there's no hope, but there is hope. You know, as, uh, as I substitute teach, uh, I've got a philosophy in, in the way that I teach. And, and, and I really think this is important because you could come into a class as a substitute teacher and you could rule with an iron fist. And believe me, there's times when you feel like you really need to. But you've got to be careful with that. Because you have to, as you deal with kids, you need to give them a little bit of hope. My, my philosophy of substitute teaching is this. Uh, every day is new with no mistakes in it. Lynn and Whitney know what movie uh, I, I got that from. Uh, I was actually a teacher in a particular movie. I'm not going to tell you because I'll lose my man card if you know uh, what movie it was. <laughs> but, uh, but at any rate, every day is new with no mistakes in it yet. Uh, you've got uh, you to remember that. And, and when there's times, especially when I'm in the same class for an extended period of time, I want the kids to know that. Because you get to know certain kids. And there are certain kids that are messing up a lot. And I want that kid to know that, you know what, today is a new day. Mr. Wagner is going to be fair with me today. I, I want them to know that. Now, as soon as they mess up, we're going to jump on them. But, uh, but I want them to know, until they give me reason, there's, there's hope. Uh, today could actually go just a little bit better. Um, if you don't have that philosophy, how are you going to treat them? You know, you could, and I know one teacher at school, he's now gone, he was, uh, he's retired years ago now, but there was this one kid that would come into his class, the moment that kid come in there, he'd say, out in the hall. I'm, I'm serious. And he made the kid go out and get in the hall and sit there. Now, if you knew the kid, you might say, well, I kind of understand why he did that. Because this kid was a, was a he, he was hard to deal with. Uh, let me put it that way. Uh, but I felt that was very unfair of that particular teacher. He needed to at least give it, I mean, at least wait for 20 minutes until the kid deserved to be sent out to the hall, you know. But, but he didn't. And, and you need to be careful how you treat them. You need to give them a chance. One of the things that I do and especially when I'm in the elementary, is they always have recess. And man, do I hold that over their head. I, I like to hold that over their head. And I don't like it when they have early recess. Because once we've had recess, now I don't have it to hold over their heads anymore. I like it when you have recess later in the day. Because I'll tell them, I'll, I'll tell this kid, oh, I, I've written your name down on here two times. You owe me five minutes on the wall at recess. And when they act up again, I say, hey, your time's up to 10 minutes on the wall at recess. But then I'll look at them and I'll say, but you know what? I'll let you earn your time back. Whoa, now the kid starts shaping up. And some of those kids get really good, and they'll earn all their time back. I like to give them all their time back. In fact, once in a while, I'll jump on a kid that's a pretty good kid but did something they shouldn't do, and I'll, make, I'll put their name up there because I know they'll earn it back, and then they'll, everybody else will see, oh, he's letting them get time back. You know, I'll do that. It's giving them hope. They've got hope. And by the way, I never keep a kid in from recess because then I don't have hope. Because now i got to deal with that kid even longer. No, you're going to be on the wall outside. I don't care if it's blizzard outside. You're going. No, sometimes you can't. You can't do that. But, uh, but no, I, I like to give them hope. And you know what? The kids, the kids respond to that. I think God does that here with Israel. I think he kind of does that with Israel. He gives them hope. I've already mentioned what happened in chapter 32 after they went through this song. And at the end, he tells them, here's the purpose of this particular song. I want you to teach it to your kids so that you guys can learn to obey and do what you ought to do. Verse 47, he says, for it's not a futile thing for you because it's your life. God's giving them a chance here. I know God's already prophesied, and in my human mind, that seems weird that he would give him a chance because he already knows what's going to happen, but yet, but yet he is giving them a chance, and some of them will respond. There will be some that will follow God. Remember that remnant that will keep following the Lord? I don't know about you, but I want to be in that remnant. I, I think within, even within the church today, there's lots of people that, that um, claim to know the Lord but will fall away from him, or even people who really do know the Lord and yet don't walk with him as they ought to. Well, I don't want to be in that group. I want to be in the remnant that's following the Lord. And I think that's what the Lord's doing here. He's challenging those people with that. He's, he's giving them hope. 
And, and if you'll think about it, there's hope all through Israel's history. Uh, they failed many times. When they were in the wilderness coming up to this point, they failed a number of times, and yet God was able to show mercy, and they would turn back to him. Uh, in the book of Judges, we're going to see that there's, there's all kinds of times that they failed. They had that cycle where uh, they were, things were going along okay, and then the people would fall away from the Lord. Then the Lord would cause them to come under some sort of hardship. They'd repent, turn back, and God would rescue them, and they would keep doing that cycle. And, and they would keep going through that. But God was showing mercy. I mean, he could have just been done with them. But instead he was showing mercy. Uh, when he sent them into captivity, he brought them back. At least some of them. And, and God continued to show mercy. When Jesus came, they rejected the Messiah. And, and they paid a price for that. But you know what? God says, I'm not done yet. I'm still going to bring you back. Many prophecies, including uh, Jeremiah 31 that talks about the new covenant, where God is going to change their hearts and give them a heart to follow him. I believe he's extending hope to them. And the idea there is that some of those people are going to be challenged to walk with him, and they ought to walk with him. Wow. We have the same thing with us in the New Testament today. God provides hope for us. Uh, I'm going to turn to a couple of New Testament passages here in uh, Romans. I'm in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says this, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You see, that, boy, that's extending hope, isn't it? None of us deserve salvation. Don't ever swallow what the world says. You deserve more. No, you don't deserve more. You deserve far less. But God gave you the opportunity to have eternal life even when you didn't deserve it. He offered all those things to us. And, and the scripture's going, I want to turn to the book of Galatians for a minute. In Galatians chapter 3, it says this, verse 21 and following. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been given by the law. But the scriptures have confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterwards be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. In other words, the law showed just how sinful we really are. We couldn't walk with God. We couldn't keep all those things. And so forth. And it, it's God's perfect righteousness. He wasn't being an ogre. He was just expressing his righteousness. And we couldn't keep up. So God offers us salvation anyway. That, that's hope. That's hope. And now, we as believers, we, we go through our life now striving to live for him. But we still struggle. We still struggle with that. In, uh, in the book of uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, God uh, deals with that. He says, look, your children of God, those of us who know Jesus as our Savior, your children of God, when you, when you aren't walking with God, he will chastise you. That's the idea of spanking. He will discipline us when he needs it. But the goal of all of that is to keep bringing us back. Keep bringing us back. God extends great hope to us so that we will keep striving to follow him and be the people that he wants to wants us to be. Well, Israel had no excuses. Uh, they were held responsible for their decisions, even though uh, um, God's mercy is still available to them. And, and they would experience his mercy numerous times throughout their history. Well, same with us. We're held responsible for our choices. We may have to be chastised from time to time by the Lord. But God's still extending mercy to us. We need to follow God. We need to turn back and keep following him. And when we're struggling to follow him, when we find ourselves caught up, I, I, I heard someone sharing something the other day. They said, I just lost control of the wheel. And, and I, I got so deep in it, there was like nothing I could do. But we can always turn back to the Lord. And the Lord can get a hold of the wheel and, and calm it down and get us back on track. And we need to remember that we do that. We need to not use any excuses. There are no excuses you can use to walk your own way and not follow the Lord. I mean, there's lots of excuses you can come up with, but none of them are legit. None of them are going to be accepted by the Lord. The Lord's given us what we need to follow him and to serve him. We need to get off the excuse train and walk with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for dealing mercifully with us. Uh, Lord, we know that you are a God of justice, and uh, 
we don't really want justice. We want mercy. And uh, we pray that you would help us to walk right with you. And Lord, when we do experience your justice, help us to not blame you, turn it on you, but rather uh, turn to you and experience your mercy. Help us to do that. Help us to walk right with you and uh, in the end be honoring to you as we follow. Thank you, Lord. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing this last song together, number 343, Like a River Glorious. 343, and again, you can remain seated. We'll sing the first and last stanza. Like a river glorious.